Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the quarantine film series. Film series. I'm your host, Kavir Segel, coming to you live from the ATL, Atlanta, from my parents' place. My mom secretly watches. So, uh, hi, mom. Thanks for watching. I need all the internet uh, connection here to get through this thing unencumbered. Um, we are doing these conversations in the morning, um, 10 30 or 11 a.m. Eastern, with great filmmakers who have, are making the films that are gonna be on your streaming services and in your theaters when they reopen in the coming months and weeks ahead. Um, you know, a lot of the film festivals are canceled. It's hard to find a sales agent, hard to find the distributor, uh, hard, to, hard to generate the buzz. So, um, you know, keep it here for these great conversations of what we really, really the, the, the story, story makers of our time. As you know, I'm hosting a quarantine concert series every night at 10 p.m. Eastern. And we've been featuring a lot of Brazilian music uh, of late, um, the great Jovino uh, Santos and uh, Celso Fonseca. And uh, this, <laughs> this particular interview coming up uh, fits in line with our Brazilian focus of late. And it's very exciting to, um, uh, to introduce you to an incredible filmmaker who uh, has been leading the game for quite a while now. He's an award-winning film director, uh, and his movie recently won three main jury awards at the San Sebastian Film Festival. 2020. And, uh, you know, if you have any questions for him, please drop a comment in the comment field. I'll try to get him to opine to your comments. And with that, please welcome to the show the incredible sizzling maestro Paxton Winters. Welcome. Yes. T tell us. I think we got you. I think, say that again. I think we had you muted. Go ahead. No, I just said I just said thanks. It's great to be here. Thank you, Kabir, Shane. Where, where is here? Where are you right now? I'm actually at my parents' house in Arizona. God, it looks nice. So, I, like what, I like what they've done with the place. <laughs> yeah, they, uh, they did a good job. I was actually in, in Miami at the festival when it was canceled midway. Hmm. So kind of popped over here to, to kind of try and be as supportive as I can. As I, I understand you're also at your parents. I am, I am. Nice yeah, to support yeah. the parents as much as we can. It's yeah, um, important. Uh, tell me... Tell me um, how has the quarantine really affected you and your plans? What were, I mean, you were at a festival apparently uh, while it was. Um, yeah, I mean, we were, to... yeah, exactly. It was. I mean, there was a, a slew of festivals. I mean, we were going from we were in Miami. From there, we were going to Tribeca, and then to the Istanbul Film Festival because a lot of my post production team, most of my post production team, was in Istanbul, and then to Moscow, Buenos Aires. There was a whole list, and then it just you know came to a grinding halt. Um, I mean, we're sort of fortunate that we had a, already had a limited run. I really feel for those who, you know, who were going to premiere at South by Southwest or Cannes, you know, all these film festivals that were that were just completely, completely canceled. Um, and it's interesting to see how now festivals are trying to go the sort of online route and what that looks like. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a, uh, I always like to ask creative professionals, how are you structuring your time in quarantine? Like, do you have a routine? Do you wake up a certain, a certain day, a certain time of the day? Do you make, have coffee? Do you uh, structure your creative time? Uh, it's, it's easy to get into a rut, you know, cause every day sort of feels like the same. So what's your process? Um, yeah, I, I definitely have a routine, um, which is kind of nice because before I was just constantly sort of on planes and, and, and hotels, but now, um, I, I'm kind of, grateful in some way obviously i'm not grateful for the pandemic but for some type of structured routine um i i wake up and start writing right away um i like to do this thing where if i'm if i'm thinking of a problem i'll go to sleep thinking of it and there's a kind of a different kind of brave uh, brain wave kind of place that you go to i don't know how to explain that but there's sort of this kind of creative place that i find is right as i'm about to fall asleep or right as i'm about to wake up so I kind of try and program myself, and then I wake up, and then just start writing before I do anything. Actually, got it. And then I'll have breakfast, coffee, exercise, and then jump in again. Cool, cool. Um, how is? Um, tell me about, uh, about Pacified, your incredible movie. What's the premise for those of us who who haven't seen it, which is I think all of us? Um, tell us about it. Um, well, it's it's set in a in a favela in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, it's a, I, it's in a favela that I, I happen to be living in for some years. And then basically some friends from there and myself decided to do kind of some short films more, more for the sake of the process, just to kind of work with some young people. I had taught a few times in Haiti at this really cool school that used to exist. 
I just like the idea, the mission of trying to give young Haitian filmmakers uh, the tools to kind of tell their own stories. So that was really kind of the idea behind sort of this first project. And then a producer uh, in New York had heard about this, Lisa Muscat, and then Darren Aronofsky heard about it. And, you know, they really encouraged me to kind of put them all together into a composite and make a, a proper sort of feature length script. So we did, and then um, I got some great Brazilian producers, Marcos Telechea and Paulo Lunetis attached. And then before we knew it, suddenly it had kind of spot, it had kind of snowballed into this bigger project with a, a proper budget. So then it was just, you know, how do you compromise and sort of keep, still keep it authentic and still keep it very organic to the place and the people that the story was about. So yeah. you know, instead of kind of going around the violence, just really quick, we tried to focus more on how it affects those people living in between, you know, mm -hmm. the sort of mm -hmm. everyday people, so to speak. A lot of the actors, including the lead, were untrained locals. How did you end up going this particular route? And uh, was there any sort of pushback from your studio to uh, to work with untrained locals? Uh, yeah. I, I, I mean, because we were going to do it all within the community at first, all the actors obviously were from, from the community, and we'd been working with uh, two of our, our, our young actors. So they were kind of already, already a part of it. Um, and actually, yes, later on, there were people at the studio um, first, they encouraged me. They said, you know, you need to really kind of cast like professional actors for some of the main leads, which I understood and sort of did that. And then at one point they said, you know, that I couldn't work with the the young, you know, the young girls who were already a part of it for, for years, uh, which was a, which was obviously a huge problem because, you know, they were so integral to it. So I had to actually go through a process of, of auditioning other kind of quote unquote kid actors. Um, and then eventually, you know, it, it's like, look, filmmaking is all about compromising, right? So sometimes you have to give and you have to compromise and then some other things you just don't. And that was definitely something that I think we all were very clear that we weren't going to compromise on. Gotcha. Gotcha. Tell me about your personal story. Why, why did you move to Brazil and live there for so long? What was the initial attraction for you? Um, well, I, I'd been living in Istanbul for, for many years, like 18 years. And then I met, uh, a Brazilian and, and started to date, uh, this woman that I met in New York. And then I sort of did the sort of long distance relationship thing. And then she had to return to Brazil. And, and so I basically, she said, you know, either come here or don't call me. <laughs> so, so I basically so. got on a plane and, and gave it a shot. And then I had shot lots of news features in, in Istanbul, among other things, like a TV series and, and a feature. And the journalists that I worked with in the Middle East called their counterparts in, in Brazil. So kind of right away, I was able to shoot news features. Mm -hmm. to, um, and then that kind of brought me, introduced me to the favelas. And then I became friends with the fixer. You know what a fixer is, right? Yep. So well, I became friends with... Sorry, well, I do, but you may want to explain it for the audience. Yeah, yeah no, fair enough. <laughs> I mean, when you when you work, so when you're going to shoot in a place like a favela, or but you have to kind of go in there with somebody who's you know from there, familiar with the area, make sure that you don't do anything you shouldn't. Um, kind of brokers the permissions, and uh, and this this guy Magas, his name, he and I sort of clicked and became friends, and then he started inviting me into the favela, you know, when we weren't working for sort of you know these crazy all night par parties and and barbecues and. And I started to get to know him and his family and his friends. And then, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, my relationship kind of unraveled after about a year and a half. And I was going to return to Istanbul. And they they sort of invited me to, you know, come live in, in the hood. Yeah. And at first, I was pretty resistant, as you can how's, imagine. How's your Portuguese, by the way? Uh, it's much better now. Good. <laughs> but when I, first moved, when I first moved there, it, uh, it wasn't so good, but... Gotcha. Um, you know, I'm obviously familiar, and the audience may be familiar with City of God um, and the success of that film. How easy was it to bring in, uh, I mean, the financial support for the film, and what makes the story so different um, compared to that one? Well, um, I mean, City of God, you know, City of God is an incredible film. It's beautifully executed. It's, um, it was definitely my first introduction to sort of that world. So also very memorable for me. I mean, you know, that film is, is very violent and it kind of it revolves around a lot of the violence. And I think we, and there's something that's kind of very sexy about it. Um, and, uh, you know, we really tried to do something different. We tried to really show a more sort of 
human side and how that violence affects people who are really just trying to live kind of normal lives. Um, you know, we tried to, to, yeah, I mean, I guess that's, and ironically, you know, when, when City of God was first released um, in Brazil, it didn't do that well. Nobody really went to see it because I think people were like, why would we want to see a movie set in the favela? And then it came here and it won all these awards. I think it won the Oscar for best foreign film, if, if I'm, if I'm, not mistaken. And then it was re-released in Brazil and it exploded. And then following that film, there was just a, a slew of quote unquote favela films. And they just kept coming out one after another and becoming more and more violent and and sort of, you know, more and more just kind of thrown together until it kind of reached a saturation point. And then by the time we had sort of come around and I wasn't really aware of this at the time, you know, most producers sort of turned their nose up and were like, oh, another favela film, no way. Hmm. So most most passed kind of right away just because they saw it as a quote unquote favela film. Uh, speaking about producers, how did you get Darren Aronofsky on board with the project, and what did he bring to the film? Um, so I uh, he's a friend. I've known him for for quite 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 many years. I met him originally at the Istanbul Film Festival when he was there for Requiem, and then we we stayed in contact and then became friends. And he just heard me talking about it. And, uh, and then he said, yeah, it's sent, you know, he was like, actually send me the script. So I sent him the script and then he called and said, oh, my people like the script. Um, and then he said, but I need to see something. So we went and kind of shot some test scenes with our, with our girl, um, and then sent it. And he, he was like, this is great. How can, you know, how can I help? So he really kind of got behind it and, you know, really threw his weight behind and, and got on a lot of calls and. And obviously for a producer knowing that he, you know, sort of is creatively behind some, some, you know, an endeavor like that, it's actually a huge vote of confidence. And he was, I mean, he, you know, he's, he's not, he doesn't love to read drafts of scripts, but he's very good at watching the film. And I mean, that he watched, you know, he said, he's like, look, I'll watch a lot of cuts. And he did, he watched a lot of cuts. And it's, it's funny because he's, you know, he's, he's almost like a savant. I mean, he can watch something. I was with my, my, my editor and he was like, whoa, whoa, whoa why did you cut frames, you know, five frames from that? And I remember thinking, this guy's crazy, five frames, whatever. And then my editor was like, yeah, I cut five frames. Wow, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but he was very helpful. Yeah, he seems, he seems like an incredible person to, to have on a project. Um, also, um, <clears throat> you talked about the violence. There was a lot of scenes. There was, there's some scenes, uh, to my knowledge, violence in, in your movie. How did you make them seem so realistic? Obviously, it's maybe the skill of you as a director, but maybe you can go through that. Well, I mean, I think we just, we talked a lot about, you know, what it's like, like how to experience, you know, what the experience of that is like for the people who, who are living it, who are in the middle of it. So for me, you know, living in a favela, one of the things that, you know, as soon as the firefights erupt and they, they erupt often, um, you know, people tend to go into their bathrooms mm -hmm. and they kind of all huddle together with their families, wherever there's like the most walls. And that's usually in the bathroom. And I had never seen that before. And that just to me was really that that was the best depiction I could think of how, of you know representing that violence. So that was kind of one side. And then I think we also tried to kind of mute it as much as we could, or have it happen either all of a sudden, you know, or kind of suddenly in the background. Because I think a lot of times what we imagine, what our imagination creates as far as as violence is concerned, is a lot can be more kind of brutal or disturbing than what you can actually kind of show. Mm -hmm. okay, if that makes it. sense. So I think it's first you kind of build the characters and then you kind of have it affect them. But you, I don't know, we just found muting it sort of helped bring it to the fore, ironically. I see. I see. Um, talk to me about the post production process. Um, we're obviously music guys over here. Uh, talks about the soundtrack, the, the music editing um, <clears throat> in that process for you. Um, well, we worked with this brilliant musician, Beto Vilares, uh, out of Brazil. I don't, um, if you're not familiar with him, you should definitely check him out. He also, I mean, he's traveled all of Brazil, recording music, working with uh, musicians all over Brazil. So he just has this, this incredible wealth of knowledge and appreciation for all the different kind of cultures uh, of Brazil. But he, you know, we talked a lot about the sort of Afro-Brazilian influences and yet he has this very, it has a very kind of score quality, but it was great. I mean, it was super enjoyable. He's got a studio in Sao Paulo and, you know, he would bring his musicians and we would go and, and sort of listen and maybe tweak things here or there. But to be honest with you, he, he did such a great job that I, you know, there's very little that I had to do. Um, yeah. 
he's it, just you know and it's and it's it's it, it's so fortunate when you can work with a musician who just really kind of gets the material and not only you know not only does something to, to sort of fit the scene but enhances it so much but yet so subtly yeah i'm, I'm excited to, to listen to, to the music he put into this um for everyone watching um let's put his website up on the screen packs of winners where there's a packs of winners .com. i want everyone to go there bookmark it subscribe so you can see the latest updates on this incredible film and his future projects. Uh, Paxton, also also about the craft of making the film. What cameras did you shoot on? What did he edit in, um, and so forth? Um, sorry, just before I, I, I head to the camera, I also want to mention. You know, you were talking about post production and sort of this new world. Um, I, I, funny enough, like so, we had we did we shot in Brazil, but then I ended up editing the film in Turkey. Mm -hmm. Um, with with my editor who I've worked with a lot, Eileen Zoitinel and that team there. Um, so then we we edited the film there and then came back to do the obviously the sound with in Sao Paulo and then we did the sound edit in Sao Paulo and then the sound mix in New York. So it's kind of interesting how these days now you can kind of call teams from all over the world. Um, as far as the the camera, we used uh, we used an Alexa Mini, Laura. Uh, Laura Marians was uh, our DP and she did an incredible job and has been winning all sorts of awards as a result of it. Juan Camera Image um, also won one of the awards in San, San Sebastian, but we just decided that that was kind of, that was the go-to camera because of its, it's obviously it's, it's, it's a great camera. I mean, the images are beautiful um, and there's so much range, but also just because it was easy to, to you know, move up and down those stairs. Got it, got it, okay. Um... You know, looking at Brazil today uh, in the news, and there's an, there's the pandemics obviously surging there. Um, do you have a sense of how it's affecting the favelas and those in the community? Uh, yeah, it's it's very it's very critical. Um, I just spoke with Maga, who was actually in, in those photos there with me, who was my co-story creator, and um, it's um, it's it's exploding now. I mean, you know, the favela are these these very dense places where people live very close together. Um, and it's also a very social environment, as you can imagine. There's a lot of music and celebration and barbecues. So in, in Prazeres, Mohodus Prazeres, the neighborhood that I, I live in and that the film was filmed in there, um, four people now have died. Somebody, another person just died yesterday. Um, and interestingly enough, the, you know, the factions, the drug trafficking factions have have kind of uh, sort of decreed uh, a curfew. No one is allowed to be out after 8 p.m. Um, no elderly are allowed to be out of their houses. So um, the community leaders, um, you know, they have basically set up this system whereby uh, if elderly people need anything, they have young people who will go and buy stuff from the store, drop it on their doorstep. So they're really trying to, to keep it at bay, but it's, it's very serious as I'm sure you're reading. Brazil now is having an explosion, and it's it's second only to to our country, to the United States. Right, right, right. Yeah, it's it's kind of sad and tragic to see. Um, uh, to Pax, and tell us what about where we can find the movie and your distribution plans for everyone wanting to to see it. I mean that that you know I <laughs> I uh, if it wasn't for COVID nineteen I I might be able to answer that better. I mean we were supposed to have a theatrical release in you know now uh in may in brazil and then from there we were going to have a, a limited theatrical release in uh in other territories but right now sort of everything is up in the up in the air so i I'm, you know i'm really not sure i guess i'd have to say <laughs> stay tuned but we will definitely as soon as things open up in brazil whenever that is we will have a, a theatrical release there and then depending you know i just you know depending on what happens with uh with the I mean, Fox is just distributing it, but we, we, we want to have a, a, a theatrical release in North America, the UK, France. But let's see what happens. I imagine there's going to be a huge kind of bottleneck for screens. Uh, so uh, you know, uh, let's see. It'll be an interesting time. I mean, I'm sure a lot of, you know, I'm sure a lot of cinemas would rather have their sort of tentpole superhero movies to get as many people in. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what the terrain is like for these kind of smaller indie films, as far as. Uh, as the edge. but I, but I'm sure there's people that also want to see that as well and get out of the house. So we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing it uh, myself. Um, what, what else are you working on? I went to tell us about, about your future projects that you have in the, in the um, yeah. Yeah. I have a, a, a project that, uh, is set in Iraq 
So we were supposed to be on a location scout now, but also that's also come to a halt. And that's basically about, um, you know, it starts off as this very typical kind of American war film. And then about 10 minutes in, it takes a, a kind of sharp left turn when this sergeant finds him is kidnapped by any, uh, a young insurgent. And then the family, the, you know, this, this young insurgent's family is kind of equally shocked that there's this soldier now in their midst. And it sort of all becomes them kind of navigating this, this family kind of navigating what to do with the soldier that they can't really let go now. Um, and then in the, in the meantime, the American soldier gets a, a kind of firsthand view of, of the occupation from the eyes of this family. Wow. Um, yeah. And then also I'm developing something in the Amazon to try and, you know, try and give a sense of the, of the lay of the land there. So do you have working titles for these? Uh, the, the outside the wire is, is the name of the, the one that takes place in Iraq and there's no working title for the Amazon yet. Gotcha. Gotcha. Cool. Uh, Pax and thanks for being a uh, part Thank of the show. For... It's sure, uh, it. a great honor to have you on everyone. Check out Paxton's website. Let's put that back up on the screen. If you can, there it is. Paxtonwinners.com for all the great, um, news on the maestro himself. And then I think they have an Instagram. There we go. <clears throat> Follow Pacified on Instagram. Pacifado Filme. My point Portuguese is not that good. Pacifado Filme, yeah. Yeah. Um, all, I, all I know is Tutu Ben. And que, tutu Ben, Tutu Ben. Tutu Ben and, uh, and Que Braturo, which, <laughs> yeah, yeah. which is in the port. How, how are things in Atlanta? You know, the tattoo parlors are open and the bowling alleys are open. So <clears throat> I haven't been. Wow. I'm, I'm not venturing out too much, but... Um, I think people are sort of getting on with it and getting back to I, I drove around a little bit yesterday people had some people had masks on but it's it's really um i'm gonna wait and see yeah Rachel. here in arizona it's like nobody's wearing masks out their families i feel like not even covid 17 reached here <laughs> i mean i'm it's yeah. uh it's, it's very interesting especially because i was in la previously came from la to arizona and la even people who are walking their dogs at midnight are wearing masks and you come over the border and here like you know restaurants, fast food places, everyone, you know, they're out with their, their whole families and nobody's wearing masks and actually you walk in with a mask and you feel sort of ashamed. <laughs> yeah. I hear you. I hear you. Well, um, one thing is I want to, I want to, I'm glad I can see you on mask right now. Very handsome fellow. And Thank you. So, Likewise. Yeah, of Cheers. course, of course. So thanks for being on the show. Uh, always great to have you and um, everyone go to his website to make sure you support Paxton and his wonderful movie. There it is. All right, we have a great show lined up tonight, 10 p.m. Eastern, um, on the Quarantine Concert Series. <clears throat> and that's with Roxana Ahmed, a wonderful singer. She's based in, I think, Miami. So we'll be going south. And I also want to give a thanks to our producer here, Shane Nabuto, who um, makes all the magic happen behind the scenes. <clears throat> if you're in the Los Angeles area, please give a knock on the door and try his hummus, one of the best hummus makers that I know. And he's just a gen gentleman all around. Um, all right. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Have a wonderful day. And if you can, stay home. Bye, everyone.